guys got water? Uh, uh, all right, well. We'll say hello. PJ. PJ. Hey, uh, let me get some audio. I'm hey, man, you there? I'm here. Can you hear me? All right. Let, let's go ahead and put them up on the screen. All right. So can you see? All right. So uh, PJ Bloom on the big screen. We've got a uh, welcome to New Orleans, man. This is PJ Bloom Skyping to us from Los Angeles, California. Say hello to the people. Hi, people. How, uh, how big is that screen? Enormous. Your head is Enormous. huge, man. Your head is really, <laughs> let me, let me turn the camera around. Oh my gosh, that's that's really big. And look, this is these, here's the people. Wave to PJ, everybody. That is at a very a very attractive audience. You know, Flattery will get you everywhere. <laughs> uh, so we are here. We are back live at the Sync Up conference. This is year eight of Sync Up, day one of 2015. Thank you all so much for being here. We just had a great conversation with the drummer Stanton Moore, and now we are rolling into our last panel discussion of the day, which is about licensing music, especially Louisiana music, to film and television productions. And we have got a panel of three, two here in, in, in person, and one from Los Angeles, and, oh, and one Skyping in from LA. So thank you all for being here, and thanks to you guys for being here. Um, we've got Chris Moler, who is, pronouncing that right? Moler, yep. Yeah, and are you originally from Louisiana? I've got roots there, yes. How could I tell? Yeah. And uh, so you work on a television show called The Originals. Yes. And our friend Kyle Lammy, who I know mostly as an audio engineer, but has a double life. D double, triple, yeah. <laughs> and, and also works as the music coordinator for a CBS television program called NCIS New Orleans. Yes, sir. And on, on the, the big screen over here, PJ Bloom, who is a very well-known music supervisor in the industry, worked on a lot of shows, perhaps, uh, is that your dog? <laughs> That's my dog barking. Uh, oh, always happens. And perhaps best well-known uh, to the public anyway uh, for your work on the show, Glee? Yeah, uh, we, just, we just wrapped this year, so that is done. Oh, that, rest in peace, that was a great show. Yes and now is working on a new show that is literally just started, it has just started to shoot on the streets of New Orleans. That's an HBO program, is that right? Yeah, it's an HBO series called Quarry. Um, Quarry. We're, shooting it, we're shooting it in New Orleans. It's not going to air until sometime next year. Um, but we're out there doing it now. I'm actually doing three television shows in New Orleans. We're doing American Horror Story here, and uh, we're also doing Ryan Murphy's new one called Scream Queens. In, in New Orleans or in Louisiana? Yeah. All right. All, all, in, all in New Orleans. So why aren't you here? Uh, you know what? I've been there twice in the last uh, in the last two weeks, so it just didn't just didn't time out. For and you didn't time. call me. I called you. That was once. You were here twice. Oh come on. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're busy, bro. Sorry. All right. So anyway, um, I think that for this one, we have done as as you guys know. So we've chatted about this this topic. And at the Sync Up conference, I mean, it's called Sync Up, for God's sakes. I mean, we, we have a very keen interest in the whole topic of um, licensing music, especially original music, to film, television, commercials, video games, whatever. And we've talked at a number of panels. PJ, you were here a few years ago and spoke on one of these panels. And it's often seemed... I don't want to say esoteric necessarily, but kind of out of reach for people because it seemed like we were kind of talking in abstracts. And what I really like about this panel is that it's very concrete because all three of y'all are actually working on shows that are filming on the streets of New Orleans right now and means that you are actually involved in going out and licensing and, and in many cases using people on camera, right? Uh, yeah, in the programs that you're doing. And people are getting real money on this stuff. So I, to me, this is a very practical, very hands-on opportunity. So what I think I want to do at this point is just, just open it up to questions. You all are here to, to talk to these guys. Some of, somebody's got to have a question about licensing their music. If you would please use the microphone in front for our global viewing Hi audience. 
Hi, um, nice to meet you all. This is one of the main reasons I came to this conference, because I found in the past a real sort of catch-22 with trying to approach like music supervisors. Frank, can you turn it up a little, please? Um, there seems to be sort of a catch-22 where if you're trying to, you, one doesn't always get the opportunity to meet music supervisors or coordinators directly. If you contact them cold, they usually want to hear from your publisher. If you don't have a publisher, that, because they want to hear from your agent, and if you don't have an agent, you know, it sort of seems like this real, the gatekeepers are quite ferocious, and to get past that can be really difficult. I'm wondering if you have any, anything to say about that. Excellent question. So, independent musician wondering if it's too difficult to get in through the gate to licensing a piece of music into a film and television show if you don't have a publisher or an agent or somebody representing you? No, I, I don't think it is whatsoever, except for it's that we get bombarded with thousands of emails every day, and it's hard to kind of navigate through those and see, okay, what's this, what's that, what's that, what's that? Um, things like this are great, because we get to know you personally, and then like, oh, here, drop me an email saying Jazz Fest Sync Up panel, um, you know, from there, and then that's, that's a little bit more um, of an introduction that basically you'll be like, oh yeah, I remember you asked that question at the panel, let's talk more and send me your music and stuff like that. But it, it, we don't mean anything uh, negative whatsoever by not getting back to people sometimes. It's just sometimes it's just, if we replied to everybody, we wouldn't be able to do our actual real job. <laughs> so, Kyle? Yeah, uh, to elaborate on that, um, I know for NCIS what I do is I love videos and audio. Um, I really don't even want anything more than a contact on the email. Um, just like they're saying, if I sit there and have to read and respond to them, then it takes just all day. Uh, but just know that if you do submit music, I mean, we're listening to it, and it's just waiting for that right scene to come up. And uh, especially if it is very New Orleans at its roots, it's going to get you know some airtime, and it's going to be seen. It's just being patient with this as well as the writers and and producers of the show who may want something specific. Yeah, because I'd also say too, um, if we don't get back to you, you probably have a better chance of getting a placement than if we do get back to you. Why is if that? We, well, because that means we're busy. Okay. And if we're not busy, you know, oh, hey, what's up, good to see you, or good to talk to you, this and that. If we're busy, it's like, you know, we're listening to music, we'll jam it real quick, we have our processes going through stuff, you know, in seconds of like, oh, that's cool, I could do, I could work with this. Um, and then something pops up, like the right scene, like he was saying. Um, and then, you know, somehow it's, you get a random email out of the blue and it's, oh wow, how did that happen? That's cool. Um, but, you know, honestly, if we don't get back to you, it's probably a better sign than if we do get back to you. So. Oh, that's interesting. PJ, do you have a, a, a comment on whether you need an agent or a publisher or somebody knocking on those doors before they're gonna get your attention? Yeah, I, you know, I, honestly, I don't think it has anything to do with, with us preferring to talk to a publisher or an agent or a record company representative. Um, you know, you, I think the reason, the reason that, well, there's two reasons that, 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 that we oftentimes deal with it that way. One, these people speak our language. So, you know, with all due respect to independent musicians and independent bands, independent artists out there, you know, you guys are busy being creative and being, being bands and write, writing songs. So that doesn't always afford you the time to learn the music business part of it and understand, you know, our language and our protocols. So in dealing with those with those people more on the professional side, it allows us to streamline those conversations. It also allows us to have confidence that when we're dealing with with very precarious things like music licensing and millions of dollars worth of worth of you know studios, studios production money, that we feel confident that that the deal is going to get done in the right way. Well, and then capitalizing on what on what Chris and Kyle said. I mean, we just don't have a lot of time. We've been hired to do a job, provide a service. That job is to provide soundtrack services to the productions in which we're involved. We all are music fanatics. We all are in the business of discovery. We all, it's our A&R. We all want to find the new and the cool thing, and we all want your music, but we just don't have the time. If we, if we, if we spent our entire day listening to music, we still wouldn't get through all the submissions that we get on a daily basis, and we wouldn't get any of the job done that, that, that we're hired to do. So, you know, we're all in this business together. We want you to feel like there's this symbiosis, and we certainly don't want you to feel like we're, you know, we're standing there sort of blocking you out, and you have to, you know, work hard to get behind this wall. It's really not about that. It's just, you know, your job is to try to get try to get your music through, and you know, our job is to try to, to try to service the productions in which we're hired. For which we're hired. Are there um, things that you have encountered 
with independent artists who aren't represented by a, a song plugger or a publisher or something that have given you agita in the, that have given you problems in in the past and that w that are or one reason why you might shy away ordinarily from dealing with somebody who isn't represented by a label or a publisher or uh, somebody well I'd say like you know as PJ was talking about you know the the paper is only as good as the person that signs it um, and you know a lot of times bands you know they they own their own publishing or they have their own masters they have a label and something like that involved but sometimes it's the comprehension and understanding of the actual document that they're signing because um, then, you know, you send it out and they're like, all right, cool, sounds good, sounds good. And then you find that there's like three other people involved. You know, maybe there's an additional publisher where you thought that, okay, this fee was going to work. And now that you add in a Warner Chapel or a Sony ATV or something like that um, with a big rider. I mean, most of the time it's, it's able to work out. But, you know, that extra time we don't have. You know, it's something, it's, it's learning and understanding the licensing process. And then from there being able to you know, when something comes in to be able to turn around immediately. Um, because the paper is only as good as the person that signs it. And people, you know, sometimes don't even know what they're signing. So. Gotcha. Kyle, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I'll say I work 90% with people who are not under labels or publishing. They own 100% of all of their music, um, which I love. It, it's great for us. Uh, One-stop shop, it's great for them. Uh, like Chris said, they just have to be savvy about the documents. Do the research and understand what you're signing and understand that, oh, well, this guy helped me write this in the studio, so I gave him percentage, but I forgot about it. You know, now I have to take the extra time to get that cleared for the show. And sometimes we're dealing with clearances overnight. And if there's a little bit of a hiccup, then sometimes we just have to move past it and, and go for something else. So I love working with the independent artists, just, you know, the ones who are savvy and understand what they're doing. Gotcha. Uh, okay, we have a question. Uh, Kim Kimball Packard, who is an artist manager, manages Glenn David Andrews, <coughs> and I'm not sure who else. Yeah, um, my, my question is, uh, when I've had success in the past uh, with placements, I've had some songwriters that I've worked with, with Glenn David, it always seems to be that I just happen to be there at the right time, that there isn't really much of a shelf life. If I solicit you and you don't have anything for that thing at the moment, then it's going to end up at the bottom of the pile and never get heard again, right? So is it, is it really, it seems to be so much based on luck most of the time that just happen to get that song in when they needed it. I usually hear back, like either right away or I never hear back. No, that does happen. Yeah. I mean, th there are moments where lightning strikes and it's just the perfect moment yeah. and you know, something comes in, it's like, this is exactly what I was looking for. Mm -hmm. This is fantastic. But there's no pile anymore because it's yeah. all digital. Right. And we have digital libraries that, you know, I'll put notes into songs and okay. things like that of yeah. like, okay, this will work for this, but I don't have anything for that right now. Yeah. So it's not, okay, we're taking the CD, we're going to drop it down to the bottom of the pile, everything like that. We keep it in mind. We, you know, Good. add to the metadata, kind of uh, keep it close to us. And, you know, we have stupid memories that are crazy that somehow like, wait, remember that email from three months ago? That guy sent me this. It's a great song. What was it called? I'll go back, search it, find it. All right, cool, that works. And so, and you know, it, it's just, there, there are certain things that sometimes things work, sometimes things yeah. don't. And you're right, there, there are moments where, you know, I'll be out at a, you know, down on Frenchman and see a band play and be like, wait, this is perfect for what I need. Mm -hmm. Oh, shit. And then, you know, from there, you go from there. Is there helpful metadata that I could be putting into the MP3s before I send along? Any additional, you know, what type of style, mm -hmm. tempo, anything like that is always okay. helpful. Any, right. any additional info you can add to the metadata is definitely cool. helpful. All right, thanks. And contact details in there, too, so. Yep. We have another question over here. Yeah, um, yeah my name's Daria, and actually, um, NCIS, you guys use my band poster in one of the episodes, so thanks for that. Um, Are you Daria from Daria and the Hip Drops? I am. All right. Thanks. Welcome. Thanks yeah, for coming. Thank you. Of course. Um, my question was, I guess I was wondering if y'all could elaborate on if y'all have any sort of selection process when it comes to more of like the scoring rather than just like the song selections. If that makes sense, like what is there, a, do you work with like one composer for an episode or a season? So I kind of, yeah, I wanted to hear more about like the composition and the scoring that goes into the episodes. Okay, so music supervisors hiring composers to write bed music as opposed to needle drop placements. PJ? Um, you know, uh, 
Uh, on the shows that I work on, and I, I would say the same for my fellow panelists, you know, they are, we're, we're blessed to, to have it be high profile enough that we're hiring singular composers to work on, on, on these entire shows. I don't often have people doing individual score type cues for me. Um, we're hiring a composer to do the entire series or the, or the entire film. Um, and it's, you know, it's, I think it's equally tough on the composer side. It kind of, it kind of works twofold. You know, it's, it's really an area that you have to work your way up. Um, you know, again, when we're dealing with these, these major studio properties and major studios, there's, there's a couple, there's a couple of main things of concern. One is they're spending so much money that they wanted, that they want to be confident that the person who's going to be involved scoring the show is going to deliver it. Um, and they are not so inclined to take chances on an unknown or a lower level composer for that reason. But the, the really the best inroad for anybody who wants to, who wants to score is to have relationships with the filmmakers. Um, you know, we as music supervisors, we guide the process, uh, we filter it for our, for our studios and our filmmakers, and then ultimately they are the decision makers. But if a, but if a director has a, an existing relationship with a composer, whether it's a, whether it's a seasoned composer or someone that's never tried it before that happens to be a good friend, then that director or that producer has the ability to force their will on the project. So if you have filmmaker friends, that's really, that's really the best possible inroad. So, got, uh, so independent films as being a good entryway to get into the scoring side of things as opposed to placements of pre-existing music? No, I, I definitely think because the more experience you have, the better you're going to be at scoring. And scoring is a whole different animal. I mean, it's, it's seeing things in you know, basically an episode or even a TV series. You have themes that you're putting together for these various characters to tell the story. And you know, I, I've worked with various artists that have you know, wanted to score, we've worked with, you know, bands that scored movies and stuff like that. And once they jump in and see the process and what we're requesting from them and asking them to do creatively, it, it's kind of crazy because they're just like, whoa, wait, I've never looked at it that way. And because you want to play moment to moment, but you have to have that thread of continuity going through it all. But yes, I mean, there's various opportunities, you know, do independent films do any project. I mean, just like even student films and stuff like that. Anything that you can do to get more experience and learn the craft a little bit better, um, get some more examples to shoot out to people, that's definitely gonna help. But most people probably get most of their initial experience in getting music into visual media projects with music that they've already recorded, probably. That's where, where most people are gonna get their, their jump. Do, do you agree? Yeah, I mean, I think I think licensing is 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 certainly the the path of least resistance to getting involved in these shows. I also think that there are there are many incredible composers, as as, as you know, including some of the top composers, names everyone knows, who 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 do work for these library production houses. Um, you know, in a in a world of reality television, um, these these music libraries are one of the dominating forces in music right now. So there are many, many, many composers who are making fantastic livings writing score cues for these library houses. Um, it's a little less sexy, um, and uh, you know, it's something that uh, something that help you know can create a career for you over time. But again, in the spirit in the spirit of of constantly honing your craft, constantly working. Um, you know, these library production houses are a wonderful outlet for people who want to be, want to be scoring and, you know, trying to generate a living from that score. Now, the reason that we, I was ex especially excited about having you all on a panel today is because you're working on projects that are happening right here. They're filming on the streets of New Orleans. So, can, I mean, Kyle, do you want to maybe give an example of how you found somebody that perhaps was unsuspecting, not necessarily trying to get in a CBS TV show, but ended up? Yeah, uh, I can't think of one band that I have used that was, hey, let me go get on this show. It's all been, like the other question, it's been lightning that struck. Um, so how does, all the, give, how does this all happen? So what happens is from the concept draft through the production drafts, we're looking at what the locations are first of all. So we're on Frenchman Street. Um, then I come in and I say, okay, this is the type of band you would see on Frenchman. And nine times out of 10, we're doing a tech scout on Frenchman Street. The director will see somebody and go, that's a really cool band too. How about we get them on? And then like that lightning in a bottle situation happens. But other than that, it's... So literally because you're there, you're here, uh, yeah. and they'll, they'll just say, oh, how about that one? They, they want it as realistic as possible. What's more real than a Wednesday afternoon when they're going to 
on a tech scout and they happen to stop at lunch somewhere and there's a band across the so, street. So can you think of anybody that's actually gotten on the show? Sure, so that kind I've of used situation? Uh, the Sweet Jones, um, a little uh, kind of folky Americana band. I've got them placed. Um, James Williams and the Swamp Donkeys. Literally, we're just playing um, behind the Cabildo and as they were setting up, you know, I, I walked past them with the, the music supervisor and we just saw him and said, hey, let's get these guys. You know, we've, we've chased musicians down on Royal Street sometimes because they would pack up and, and they were heading home and we could just hear them from blocks away. That's the girl I've been looking for for a month and a half. Let's go get her contact. So it's just, it's just being out there and, and seeing exactly what New Orleans has to offer and we want that realistic aspect in our show as well. Wow. Now, now, Chris, you're working on a show uh, that's on the CW network called The Originals. Yes. And so that's the vampire show. Yes. Are y'all familiar with this, with this TV show? Uh, yeah, we got somebody. Okay. <laughs> so can, so you, you. you guys are the same thing. You're here in town. You're shooting. Can you give an example right. of, of finding we'll, somebody? We'll run around. I mean, when we shot the pilot, uh, I remember we ran across this band called Yes Man, which was kind of an Americana band. Um, very cool. Uh, kid uses a suitcase that he sits on with the reverse uh, kick drum uh, kick uh, as his drum and you know we came we're like oh they're awesome they're fantastic this is great and then we had a scene pop up they're like let's hit him up let's bring him on the show and it was and that was just from wandering around the streets down like Royal Street or something like that you know one day and saw him play and then seen other ones and you know things like that I, I think that's the best way to find authentic great music for the shows is you know wander through the streets and go to the clubs and see and bands. so you are you guys going out into the clubs or are you like you know going to dba or yeah, that's, you that's know? the fun part yes definitely oh. that's my favorite we part like of our New job Orleans. Okay. i love going to music i venues. think we actually have a clip of yes ma'am being in the cw series the originals tony can we so this is a band that you literally found on the street and it ended up on on a CB, uh, a, a nationally broadcast, not CBS, that's Kyle's show, but you're on the CW. CW, yep. At, let's, let's see it. I don't know if PJ, you'll be able to see this where you are. It's good to see you. I was worried you thought I was some hothead after that display at the masquerade. We all have our hot-headed moments. Anyway, I'm almost done here until cleanup, so the two of us girls can hang out if you need to go schmooze or whatever. You know, he was supposed to stop hovering like 10 minutes ago. Which one's the vampire? You see what I mean? Authority They're issues. They're pretty much all vampires. I'll go oh, talk to the mayor. Okay. Oh, watch this show. We got a witch in there. We got a vampire. Oh, yeah. Werewolves run around. So what's his name? Hot guy with the fiddle. Tim. I knew he'd be here. He always performs All right. at these. All right, we get the idea. So, 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 scene with uh, that's taking place in a bar. You needed somebody to yeah, be on actually, stage. Actually, in that uh, same episode, we had the Stooges Brass Band come in and shoot with us also. Oh, so fantastic! Walter and all them. Were I'm sure, we all know the, the Stooges so. Brass Band. So, so this is a situation where the band, band that you found on the street, ends up on camera. In the show, yep. so they get paid a fee. Yeah, we license to, their song too, which they. You know, but but they're getting, they're also being paid as actors, yeah, right? Yeah, to they're be, paid to as be, actors, so they get the daily rate and everything like that. But um, in addition, you know, get a licensed track, uh, which they only had up on Bandcamp at the time. And it was a uh, song that was just online. It was not even a physical release. No physical release. Yeah, I think they had some that they sold on the street, but they were burned copies, stuff like that. But uh, so yeah. obviously, a song they wrote that they owned. Yeah, they owned. Yeah. And what about, but did you use their master recording or did you record Use their master recording for playback, yes. Yep. So did they actually then get the master use fee and the, the synchronization the fee as a songwriter? Yeah, it's just better for, you know, there's different times. We've done live recording. We've also done, um, you know, playback where they mime to it. It just matters on the location. But so when, when you get put the, so, uh, and I guess this happens to all you guys, sometimes you'll take the band and you'll take their CD, plop that in, they get the master, but sometimes you'll put them in a studio, record something, that you that you will use on the audio for the show, then they don't own that master. You own that master, or the production owns that. Yeah, master. or or we'll just do live recording on set. I mean, I know PJ's doing a lot of that right now. So, and so when when you record something live on set, that that master belongs to the to the to the production. 
that not to correct the, okay yeah the, yeah the shows the shows need to own everything i mean it, it, the show itself needs to be a fully contained entity when they when they sell it and when they air it so that's you know the music is included in that. well uh i think you know the folks in our audience are, are the folks that make and sell their own records so they're probably interested in those opportunities when they can not just get the publishing money but also get the master use fees so that's awesome now cindy we had a, you had a question before did you want to Oh, awesome. We answered your question. Fantastic. We have a question over here. Hey, everybody. Thank you for joining us, PJ and everybody. Uh, my name is Graham, and I want to go back to scoring just a little bit. I formerly worked with a kind of a production group of sorts that's disbanded, did some stuff for the Discovery Channel. We did some, some movie stuff, some indie movie stuff, and I'm trying to get more into that. See, we had some connections before, some guys that knew people at ESPN and Discovery Channel and stuff like that. But trying to get meet filmmakers, would you suggest just going to L.A. and just trying to chase people down in the street? I've got a pretty extensive catalog of music of several genres, New Orleans stuff, you know, electronic stuff, funky stuff, really over a couple hundred songs that could be used for scoring. So how do I meet these people myself? Well, I would say <laughs> what's interesting, too, is that, you know, uh, Louisiana has... Uh, tax incentive, a rebate. Um, mm -hmm. Georgia, other states have those too. There's more and more films shooting right here in New Orleans and you know, in Louisiana in general. There's plenty of filmmakers right around here. I mean, maybe it's even finding post houses uh, yeah. to make contacts with, become friends with, stuff like that. But yes, you know, all in all, LA is a great place to meet people also. Um, that's where a lot of post does happen for these productions that are mm -hmm. shot here. Well, can, I, can I ask you guys, so following up on that and the film incentive program, how much of the fact that you three guys are do, doing, that we're here right now, has to do with the fact that Louisiana has these, these film incentives? You know, everything. That's, that's, so, that's everything. It, it so it's 100% re the responsible for the fact that you guys are actually out here and licensing music. So that the, that's the only reason that we're here, and I'll, I'll even go a step farther to say that we, we priced out making these shows in other parts of the country and have them bid against each other and louisiana just consistently comes in better priced than now, these other these other cities is there any part of the the film incentive program as far as you know that get, that gives you an added reason to use music from here other than the fact that it just you know it fits because you're shooting here and maybe it's set here as well or i mean does the, the incentive incentivize you to want to use the music in any way or, or not so much it, it, it doesn't really cross over into the music aspect this is this is more the employment part of it and the location part of it and what these what these companies are paying for permits from from the city um, I think the incentive is the fact that we're actually here you know locally on location and certainly for on-camera music opportunities um, the easiest thing to do is to find to find local talent and just by the nature of being here and our geography, we're, we're, we're immersing ourselves in, in, you know, local Louisiana music. So, you know, by virtue of that, um, and by virtue of some shows, you know, like, like NCIS, you know, which is, which is specifically a New Orleans based show. Um, I'm not sure if the originals is actually supposed to be taking place in New Orleans. Is it? Yeah. It's supposed to take place. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so just by virtue of that, and your um, show is actually set in Memphis, although you're shooting in New Orleans. My show is actually set in Memphis, 1972, <laughs> of all places. But um, oh, so you, know, you so need you need Stax so Records, is what you need. And we got we're shooting a little bit here in New Orleans, but but actually the challenge the challenge there is to find to find New Orleans bands that don't sound like they're New Orleans bands. You know, this this is a very unique part of the country, and the indigenous sound here is is, is kind of unique to itself. So one of the bigger challenges has been for us to find to find bands that that do something that. Um, sort of transcend the New Orleans thing, you know, a little more, a little more um, Americana or a little more, you know, accessible and, you know, to a global audience. Good luck with that, my friend. I wanted to... Yes. <laughs> so, touch back upon the incentives thing that you were just asking. Um, I haven't looked into it for a while, but once upon a time, if you used the LPO, there was an additional um, tax The Louisiana Philharmonic you. Orchestra? Yes, sir. If you, you If you used that for scoring... Then they were offering an additional five or ten percent. I don't know if that's. Still I think that might have been because of the um, the payroll tax. So you were using a, a, a payroll. In, um, I don't know if it was the tax on the payroll, but because you were hiring people, uh, it was rolled into the um, yeah. basically the the employment part of your package, and there was an additional incentive for hiring folks. But would you? What would you say? 
if you found out, as we found out at a panel earlier here this morning, that there is right now in the Louisiana legislature a bill that was introduced this week to add an additional 15% on top of the 30% tax credit for filmmaking if you use Louisiana-owned copyrighted music in your productions. So, an, a, a, so a copyright owner's incentive, you get, if you license a Louisiana song, hire a Louisiana music composer, that's 15% more than the, so 45% over 30%. What do you think your finance office would say to that? I guess PJ and I are moving to New Orleans, so. <laughs> Our work here is done, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, I'll see you all at Jazz Fest. Yeah, I, I, I personally um, don't I think mean, I gotta be honest. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Kyle. Oh, sorry, PJ. I, I was just quickly, quickly. Uh, I don't think there's anything bad about any incentive because the, the amount that you're saving or the amount that you have to pay extra through all the legalities of it, there's more and more things coming down here because of it. So it's just a numbers game. It's going to keep building and they're going to be keeping more and more productions. And if it's, if it's tied in with music, that's great as well. Then they'll start recording more down here, you know. PJ, you were going to say something? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think um, you know, score, scoring is one thing, but as far as licensing music, in an in an ideal situation, um, it would be great to to get incredible music and save more money. And and certainly those bean counters on the accounting side and the finance side would love that, and they would push that agenda. The reality is that that you know the the, the creative leaders of these shows, the directors and the producers, they're going to use what they want to use, and and it's and it's our job to facilitate the best creative creative soundtrack for the projects we're involved with. That may or may not be indigenous music to New Orleans. If if they want to use a song that's, you know, from a band from Darkest Peru, that's what we're going to use, even if it costs 15% more, even if it costs 200% more. That's the song that we're going to use, and it's our job to, to deliver that song. I think that we can certainly push the New Orleans agenda. We can certainly try to try to have influence um, and, and, and take advantage of those incentives. But ultimately, we're here to serve and do the best creative thing for the project. And if, and if the director, the producer, the studio subscribes to the notion that we're going to focus on New Orleans music or focus on Louisiana music, then that's what we'll do. But if, but if they don't, it's going to be difficult to, to press that agenda. Well, I mean, in your case, you're working on a show that's set in Memphis, but filming in New Orleans. You're filming here because of the, the incentives. Um, right. So you don't think that if you could find m musicians in New... I mean, well, are you going to... Do you have to find music here? Or does, are you going to use music that, you know, could be recorded in Vancouver? Does it matter? Well, for, for the source material, we can, we can use music from anywhere. For the, for the on-camera bands... Um, we don't necessarily have to use fans here in New Orleans. It's just the easiest and the and the and the most economical. You know, I I, I don't have money to be flying people in. Um, you know, so so it's you know great to get bands that that play locally, that uh, you know live half a mile from wherever our set is. It allows us to do rehearsals with these bands. It, it allows us to do easily do pre-records if we have to do that. Um, so it's just it's just easier. Um, and there's incredible talent here. I mean, we've had we've had an opportunity to use fantastic local acts here that everybody's been been just thrilled with. So you know, again, just just by in the spirit in the spirit of of, of geography, the fact that we're here is going to is going to be advantageous for for the New Orleans music community. Awesome. Thank you. you have, we have a question. A couple of questions. Yes, sir. I have a. It's kind of a two-part question. Um, considering your comment about the LPO and doing recordings here and the ability to purchase what you uh, want from anywhere in the world, where do you think the local industry is at supplying uh, you know, na nationwide international film communities with products they want? And where are we weak here? And what could we do here in our local industry to be even more competitive and to keep you from looking elsewhere? And then another question, completely unrelated. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what your process might be in a crunch time situation where you know what you want, you know when you need it, but you may have to make it happen. Do you have any methods or uh, you know ways of approaching that uh, that could give us some insight to those situations where you may actually need something out of your comfort zone? All right, so wh where are we in terms of our ability to, to deliver what you need? You guys, let's, let's stick to the, the situation at hand. You're working on these shows. Are you encountering, I mean, not so much the, 
the, the orchestra, but are you finding musicians that, you know, you, they may sound great, they look great on the street, and then you start working together, and it's like, oh, man, this isn't working. Oh, well, I think it's funny, and, you know, you guys may be realizing this, but it's New Orleans, and bands work on New Orleans time, and it's just a laid-back sense that what we do, have What do you mean here. by that, Kyle? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's, yeah. that's about the... <laughs> I, I'm sure they've come across it already. Uh, we're just laid back over here. It's a very calm, cool collect no matter what, and that's just you know the mind frame they have. But as far as what they give us, it's, it's gold always. And it's kind of funny because you're gonna start seeing some Royal Street you know, musicians driving BMWs because we are all using the same bands everywhere. And I'm sure other shows are using them. I mean, once they get out there and the, the words out about who they are and what they do, Every production is picking them up and using them. So it's a great time for everybody right now. Chris? I mean, it's also like going back to the tax incentive. Uh, yeah, but if you had any of those, like, oh, shit, this is not working at all oh, yeah. with well, any local uh, bands. Things happen. I mean, it's, okay. it, the entertainment industry is all about, okay, something happens. Let's figure it out. Let's, you know, let's go from there and let's resolve it. If you're here in New Orleans, luckily, you, know, you can kind of tweak that a little bit, this and that. But, I mean, once you're kind of locked in, you're spending so much money on that particular scene, that shoot day and stuff like that. It's not working. You got to figure it out one way or another. Whether you it's make a it different work. song, you got to make it work. Um, either that or find a band very quickly. But most of the time, it's figuring out what you have. You know, you're kind of locked into that, and you go from there. So great. And the other part of the question was asking about your process and how you go about identifying. Can you clarify? The question is, what's your strategy in a time crunch situation uh, when you need something right away? That we call the people that we know, that we trust. Like basically, if we need something immediately, we call the people that we trust 100% that they will be able to get us something in that vein or that ballpark cleared. You know, so it's going to no be somebody you've asked. worked with before. Yeah, it's going to be somebody. It's going to find somebody that's going to make it the easiest situation to resolve. Yeah, what, 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 um, we're not, we're not, we're not rolling the dice on anything at that point. We're in a pinch. If I need something, something, as soon as I call people I know, if I need something on camera, I'd probably, I'd probably call Kyle and say, hey man, my situation, I need a ringer, I need a ringer in 24 hours. God. You sound like an alien. Uh, uh, I think, PJ, we're having some audio problems on this end. I don't know, we're... Like okay, can you hear me? Now we are. Yeah, yeah. You uh, just got a little bit garbled in that last one. Can that you say sucks, that? Because I, I said something incredibly profound just now. Okay, well, moving right along. Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. Okay. Take two. Take two. Can you just recap? Uh, no, I was, I was, I was just saying that that if we're if we're in a pinch, um, as Chris said, I'm going to my friends uh, who who know the situation. If I need something to be licensed, and I need it immediately. I'll go to people I know. If I'm in a if I'm in an on camera situation. Oh, I would call Kyle and say, say, hey, man, I'm totally in a pinch. I need a ringer in 24 hours. Hit me. And, and I gotta be, it's got to be completely cleared. It's got to be completely within my budget. No messing around. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. Um, one thing that we do, uh, we work really closely with Delphio Marcellus. I have him pre-cleared in his own deal. So I know if I need anything in a very, very small pinch, I, I know it's cleared, I can submit it, and then we're done. So it's just doing a little bit of homework and maybe thinking <coughs> ahead. And uh, if you can get those pre-cleared standard deals, it's always helpful if you get in that situation. Uh, at an earlier panel, talking on a sim similar subject, one of the questions came up with, especially when dealing with local musicians, is sometimes, and I guess maybe street bands may be uh, even more dangerous example of this is sometimes they neglect to do stuff like register their copyrights. Are you running into this as an issue? I, I'm not so much an issue. Um, it, I find more of the street musicians not taking advantage of ASCAP and BMI. That's royalty money that's going to get cut when the cue sheets come out and they're like, oh, I'm not registered. It's like, well, it's mailbox money. It may not, you know, I can live off of it, but it's still your money that's going to come across. Now, a radio station won't play a record that's not registered with the PRO. What about the TV networks? Um, I've used songs before that were just copyrighted without being BMI. So they'll let, them go, they'll let it get on the air if it's not? As long as it's copyrighted, and it's, we pass through a musicologist so, to make sure it is not a ripoff of anything. But if it's, if it's their song, we'll use it, yeah. Wow, okay. I think we, we covered that one. Question, another question from the audience. 
Hey guys, you mentioned earlier about um, actors get, I mean, bands receiving, uh, tongue dot, excuse me, um, for bands who are performing in an episode, they get an, a daily rate from, um, and I was wondering if they would get residuals from being in the episode or if they just receive money from the PROs. Okay, question about residuals uh, for artists, musicians appearing on camera as actors. You probably know more about this. So, uh, NCIS works under the American Federation of Musicians, um, which is a local music union. Uh, they get paid their day rates, they get paid their SAG rates. They won't see any residual money for the likeness, um, but they'll see it through BMI and ASCAP for their music. So the public performance royalties for the public performance of their copyrighted song, but not for them being an actor, getting an actor's residual like a SAG artist Correct. might. Yeah, and that, that's one of the important things of registering the copyrights, because that's money that just goes into a bank account and sits there until that's registered. I mean, basically, you're missing out on money. Yeah, yeah and I'll, I'll tell you something interesting. It breaks down. Only, only sync are going to receive the screen. Uh -huh. You're being profound again, aren't you? Really was profound too. Wait, wait we just had some more garble. Does it go back, Hello? back, back it up. Can you hear me? Now we can. Now we can. Go ahead. Okay. Well, in, ter in terms of the unions, Louisiana is a right to work state, so we do not, we do not need to go union. Oftentimes, that means we're not going to, we're not going to do AFM. So if we're, if we're not an AFM show, like Corey is, then the musician component is not going to receive residuals. However. Screen Actors Guild always pays residuals, but only the singers in the band are going to receive Screen Actors Guild payments. So there is there is every situation where where there might be a band, there might be five players and two singers. The two singers might receive nine hundred dollars and residuals for their work. If it's AFM, the AFM band players might receive three hundred dollars and residuals. They might receive three hundred dollars and no residuals. It's it's, a, it's an awful discrepancy, to be totally frank, and, and the way the unions work um, really highlight and overpay people who, who do one thing and underpay people who do another thing, but they all contribute equally to the creative process. So it's, it's oftentimes a difficult conversation for us to have when I get to have to tell the singers, you're going to make $900 plus residuals, and the, and the, and the musicians, the guitar player, the drummer is going to make $300 and no residuals. But that's a reality we have to deal with. Wow. So, all right, equal pay for equal work. Bass players of the world unite. This is not fair, people. Power to the bass players. Uh, bass players, players only get $25. <laughs> what about the drummer? Drummer pays us. OK. Did we answer your question? We did. All right, great, thanks. All right, we have another question from the audience. Hey, Mitch. Hi, I'm Mitch Woods, uh, piano player, band leader, musician. A uh, couple of questions. Uh, is there a database for music supervisors that musicians can tap into somewhere that you would know of? First question. There are books out there. There's, I mean, search. I would just search the projects. IMDB, you can find out who the music supervisor, who the you know music department, everything like that. And it's pretty easy to find people's contact. And they contact usually have a contact email or something? They usually have a contact email on that? Yeah, no, normally you can find, or just search the person's name. I mean, it's crazy. If, you know, people yeah. are like, oh, I found your name online. I just did a search your name. Your phone number popped up. So I gave you a call. I was like, all right, cool. Okay. Sounds good. So. I don't know about the state government publishing that information for shows that are shooting here. <laughs> Do you guys, I don't know if there's that type of resource. No, I don't, I don't think so. Okay. But, don't th think but so. there are A&R lists. There are music supervisor lists that you can purchase online. Definitely. You can. can subscribe to that stuff. Okay. Offbeat Magazine? Wait, make... not right, we're asking not about musicians. Music not musicians, music supervisors. Music supervisors, the people who choose the music right. to go into movies. Right. Yeah, yeah. No, that's harder to find. And then I got, oh. Uh, did... Yep, PJ, go ahead. Yeah, I, ju I just want to make a suggestion. I, I think that there is an argument, say, that constantly trying to contact music supervisors and have relationships with music supervisors is really looking at it the wrong end of the policy. What you really need to do <laughs> is... Hear me? Can you hear me? You're skipping, you're it, skipping. It's, it's, only, it's only when you say good stuff that, it, that, yeah. the, that the thing freezes. You were saying, when, when you're you're saying contacting music bad. supervisors isn't a great idea. Why? 
Well, it's, I think you're looking at it through the wrong end of the telescope. What you really need to do is figure out the kind of music that you play and the genre, and then start searching out the productions that use the kind of music that, that yeah. you're playing. Right. And then figure out who the person is that's putting the music into show after that. You know, I, 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 am, I work on so many things and I'm so busy all the time. I don't have time to deal with anybody's music that, that isn't directly related to the shows that I'm working on. So if, I'm, if, you, if, you're, if you're a hip hop artist and I'm not working on a show that uses any hip hop, I don't give a shit what you do. I only care, I only care about the music that, that I need at that moment. So you would, it would behoove you to spend more time looking at the productions and trying to trying to figure that out and see what kind of music they're using and then figure out who to get it to. Well, I guess he told you. Well, that leads me to my next thing. Uh, I did a uh, CD DVD with the Fats Domino Band back in 2001, and it's all original material, very New Orleans. It's all New Orleans. And I reunited these guys, and uh, I'm going to hand these to you to see if you can use them. Come on up, give, it, give them a CD. That's what they're here for. <laughs> Luckily, right. PJ's not here because he doesn't do CDs. So. <laughs> well, we'll send you one, PJ. All right, so I'll but Chris, you were going to say? I'll send you a link. I don't, I don't accept CDs. <laughs> I know. No, you seriously? I no, I, t I don't take CDs. I, I stopped taking CDs years ago. It's it's an irrelevant medium for me, and it's and it's an irrelevant medium for most people that do what we do. We're not record companies. We don't care what you look like. We don't really. We don't. We don't it's just. It's just. The physical world of CDs are not relevant to me. It's not green. I don't want them. I only take digital material. All right. Five years ago, that was not the case, right? Uh, I would say five years ago, I was probably making the shift at that point. So because the, the, the companies like AudioSocket that's located here in New Orleans, that's an online supplier of music. Do you, do you guys ever use any of these licensing, digital licensing clearing places? Hmm? No, I mean, I have worked with them a little bit. Okay, so, so all right, so because this is news, actually, because, I mean, somebody just now just, just handed up some CDs. So are, are, do you guys agree that the digital formats, the digital hubs are the places to get me? You're saying that you found I, a band that was only on SoundCloud, I think, right? Right, I, yeah, I, I really appreciate camp. the CD, but I have a million that are just taking up floor space at my house. I will transfer them, but you got to remember, um, just like PJ said, it's digital. Uh, when I quickly need to go and find a song, I go to my iTunes and I have everything categorized in playlists. I know what I'm looking for on my iTunes. To transfer this and listen to it and go through the tracks, it's just too, too time consuming. To so right. what, what, what about if somebody emails you a link to a SoundCloud or a YouTube, is that helpful or do as you want to go to like a clearance place? Well, as long as it's downloadable and batch right. downloadable because sometimes you have issues with, okay, I can only download one song at a time, so make sure that, you know, Box or, you know, there's so many different formats out there or websites that you can upload music and send links. But if I have to download each individual track, I'm probably not going to download it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, so Mitch, um, thanks for the CD. But you know, we're learning that. As, oh, oh, oh I, I bonus! Actually, it's a I DVD. Like okay, CDs, so PJ, so. you really missed out, bro. Sorry. Um, question? Yes, Daria. Um, yeah, y'all mentioned Audio Socket, and there's of course you know several other things that. Um, Audio Socket is a sponsor of the Sync Up Conference, by the way, so that's why they get a free plug. Nice. Yeah. Actually, it's I, not free, <laughs> but. Anyway. Well, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, like I, uh, I get pitched actually by a couple different um, houses like that. Like there's Music Dealers and Rumblefish and Pump Audio. Um, so yeah, actually when Scott brought this up, I thought that was a really good question. I was wondering if, yeah, how frequently y'all use places like that and if some are more favorites than others or if you don't use it at all. We use everything. A any resource possible that's a good resource, that's people that we trust, we use it. I mean, it, anybody and everybody, um, as long as they're reputable and cool. But let's talk specifically about the shows that you guys are doing that are filming right here. Are you, are, so you, it's not just exclusive crawl crawling through the bars and the streets and finding stuff. It's these other online resources as well. Kyle? Correct, yes. I, uh, I use Louisiana Red Hot and Mardi Gras Records. Actually, Mardi Gras Records... Uh, over the course of our two Mardi Gras episodes, um, we placed like five songs from them. 
you know, it's just, it, it didn't start off like that. It just ended up being all the songs we wanted, went through them, so we got very good um, with knowing to go back to them if we need something. So, PJ, you know, you're in yep. L.A. a lot of the time. Come to New Orleans periodically for the show. The show's shooting here, but set in Memphis. You're not exclusively looking for people that you're going to find, you know, walking down Royal Street. You're looking through to your usual sources, as you would on any other project? To license existing music? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I would say so. I mean, there's, um, there, there's a lot of different companies doing a lot of different things. And honestly, they're all... They all have so much different content and so many so many different catalogs. I think that you know generally we kind of we kind of take it down to you know a where are our strongest relationships where where have we done the most and the, the highest quality business. But then you know everybody's catalogs are different. Not everybody has everything. Some people are strong in, in certain genres in certain areas. So I think that's a that's a, that's a big filter for us. You know who has the material that we're actually looking for? Who has a lot of it? And who have we done quality business with? Well, and, and going back to, you know, researching the productions or like that, we're going to be a lot more apt to listen to your music and check it out if it's relevant to what we're actually working on at that very moment. Um, because if we get sent something like PJ saying, oh, rap music, cool, I don't need that. Why did it get sent to me, this and that? You know, if it's Now great, I'm pissed off. No, not pissed off, but it's just like the time is very valuable. I mean, it's You'll forget things. about those a lot quicker than you will if it makes sense for what you're shooting. If so, so I'm a musician. You guys are all, sh you know, music supervising shows that are shooting on the streets of New Orleans. I want to get my, my song in your show. What do I do? I, I mean, I can just speak for myself. I am a YouTube fanatic because when it comes to NCIS, we, the, the directors, producers want to see, you know, first and foremost. Uh, I've become very good at downloading from YouTube. It's a cool little trick. But I need to see the band first. Then once the director likes their look, then I go from there and then I get the so original So it's all music. about the on camera. For me it is, yeah. Now I, I will say when I work with post-production on the show, sometimes it is, just like I said, it's needle drop, it's source music. So it's just having that original music somewhere for me to find. But I will find but how, it. But how am I gonna get you to look at my video? How are you gonna you, know about me? It's this, you tag. You put it on, for me at least, YouTube and tag it. You put it on iTunes and you categorize it correctly. Uh, so you'll find it because you're searching. I'm searching for it. Now, I also take submissions. Um, I have a, a, a Gmail that I set up and I have no problem with people just flooding it and then I'll go through it systematically when I'm off a day or two and go through it that way. I'm sure that's gonna end sooner or later as it picks up, but I mean, yeah, it's, it, when we're searching for it, it, it just has to be able to be found somewhere. All right, well, you guys are here right now. There are p musicians in the audience that want to get their stuff. They want your money, is what they want. Well, and we want to give them money if it's great music for our productions and stuff like that. Like, you know, working on the originals, we are trying to uh, put in real, authentic New Orleans music. Like, we want it to be authentic. So real. what's my best way of getting you to consider me for your show? Um, NCIS NOLA music at Gmail. NCIS NOLA music, music at, at Gmail. Gmail. I've got an email, a Gmail also, sendchrismusic at gmail.com. Sendchrismusic at gmail.com. Yeah. So anybody, so. And that's just submissions. But that's now, just straight up. So, so if I, so you would but, advise But tag me? it, like put something in the, in the uh, subject line of New Orleans music, jazz, brass band, you know, Americana, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'll be more apt to check it out if it is and, you know. PJ, what's my best shot for getting your attention? If I'm a musician, um, well, I actually, I actually have about four, four or five more on-camera spots to fill over the next next two or three months. Um, <clears throat> I think uh, what I would like to do is perhaps give you a list, Scott, of spe the specific style of bands that I'm looking for. Oh no! Don't make this my problem, stuff. dude. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean, if there's if there if there's a way for me to 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 give you the specifics of the of the type of bands that I'm looking for and the type of music, maybe we could do something through the through the Jazz Heritage site. Is that possible? Uh, maybe through our social media. Would that be helpful? Do you want me to post on Facebook? These are the types of bands that PJ Bloom is looking no. for. No, no, please do not post on Facebook. <laughs> I, I tell you what else. I I because like, I don't have to miss the actual actual type of acts that I'm looking for, but I am I am very much indeed, and we're very interested in local NOLA talent. So I'm trying to try to figure out the best the best way to make that happen. Um, okay, but maybe we could post it um, as a link on the on the SyncUp Conference website, 
if, if you had specific parameters. If you're yeah, all, that if sounds, you're, that, yeah, that sounds like a great idea because I do have very specific parameters. And to be totally honest, I, I just don't want to get inundated with a bunch of stuff I'm not looking for. So I'll, I will give you the specific parameters of what that what that is, what we're looking for over the next couple months. And if we can do something on the sync up site, everybody in this room will know about it, and 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 hopefully you know a little bit beyond that. It, well, one more thing too. I, you know, we were talking about you like videos. I love to see videos too. See you know the artists and how they perform and stuff like that. One issue I have come across with some New Orleans artists is they don't have recorded music. They do not have recorded music. Yeah, they, they play shows all the time. They have YouTube links, stuff like that. But there's certain artists that just don't even have recorded music. So that's going to be so that makes it very difficult. That's a to big hindrance. Something. If yeah. you can't check them out yeah. from the comfort of your laptop, that's going to be a problem. Well, I mean, you know, I can check them out on YouTube. There's oh yeah, well, here's us down a royal. Here's us on Frenchman. Here's us that. Here's us DBA. Here's you know, we're playing somewhere so else. So they may have a... Uh, but, but, and then I might like it, and then it's like, oh, but you don't have it recorded. That's going to be Now difficult. it's your problem. You have to get them in a studio and record you know, something. Well, stu well, I'm not going to go out of the way to try to record them because we don't have time to do that. So then they're out. So they're out. Yeah, that's, that, that's actually not an issue, not an issue for us at this point because, because we're, looking, we're looking for style. We're looking for a, a specific look, and we're, we're giving everybody covers to play because it's, because it's 1972 Memphis, so we're... We're basically assigning them songs to learn and play. So what, I, what, what I'm really looking for is, is a the type of band, a type of style, and that there's enough musicianship, music, musicality to know that they can learn the covers we want them to do. Are you and also, with, so, I'm sorry, I'm just asking, are you also recording stuff on set? You we are. are. Okay. We strictly do it as well. Yes. Yeah, we won't do playback to um, a mastered CD. Okay, interesting. All right, we have time for one, maybe two questions, and then and then we got to go. Sweet. Hey, y'all. My name is Greg Morrow, and uh, my band's the Crescent City Groove. We play like jazz and funk and fusion. But uh, my question is, with the tags, um, like, what are some good tags? Um, you know, like New Orleans music. Uh, I mean, like, just for like YouTube, just like shout out some like good tags to tag our music for. I mean, you know? should they tag NCIS New Orleans? Please no. <laughs> Please don't. Okay. <laughs> I'll do it if it works. <laughs> no, uh, specific New Orleans music is good, but that's not specific. I didn't think so. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, trumpet, jazz, uh, uh, sounds like Louis Armstrong. You know, something that just helps because New Orleans music is, as we all know, there's eight different genres of actual New Orleans music down here. Uh, so that's a really bad tag to do, but it helps yeah. you get in the ballpark. You just want to be a little bit more specific. Yeah, any, anything to make it more specific, where it's like you know trumpet or brass band or mm -hmm. funk or you know New Orleans, definitely put that in there. Um, anything you can do just to kind of pare it down a little bit more is best. PJ, do you search on YouTube? Does tagging help you at all? Yeah, it's. I mean, it's 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 everything. I mean, you have to you have to tag. You have to think like a like a marketing and promotion person when you when you tag. Don't think like a teenager and put like hashtag awesome. You know. <laughs> You've been watching Glee. <laughs> yeah, it's like you really you know you you need to you need to think about the search words that are that are that are going to be triggers when there are people out there looking to looking to purchase your music or, or put you on camera or are actually going to be looking for. All right, Greg, do we answer your question? No, that's it. Thank you. All right, one more question. Okay, I have a very pragmatic question for artists. Um, like he's saying CDs are outdated. He doesn't want to download each song. Um, if you're an artist and you do want to submit music, what form, like traditional MP3 files, zip files, sonic bits, like it seems like it's ever-changing and maybe all three of y'all have different preferred ways or the best. Well, they want to see you, so they want it on YouTube, number one. Okay. So a video. If if we're if we're if we're doing stuff on camera. Yeah, I was gonna say um, a zip file of MP3s. The quickest way to download it doesn't take a lot of time. Zip file of MP3. Yeah, okay. of your whole album or the your whole, whole album in a zip file. I always tell people send me your three favorite songs. You know, because okay. some albums have filler songs and all. Send me your three favorite songs, zip file, MP3, um, and then you know include a video or pictures. Okay. In, in, in the email as well, and that's, that's how I prefer to get it. Yeah, I agree, MP3. I mean, if we need the lossless file, the AIF or WAVE, we'll reach out for it. Um, but yeah, so something small, doesn't take up too much space, quick to download, um, any information you give about the band, whether you rep, whether you own master and publishing, um, if there are co-publishers, who they are, et cetera, mm -hmm. so that's going to make a difference on fees and the, the navigation of clearance and stuff like that. Um, 
but yeah, and not, and not, you don't have to go too in depth. We don't need like a bio of, you know, where you went to kindergarten and all kinds of fun stuff. But, you know, as long as it's basic info, what type of music, what would be good for? Like, if you're like, hey, this would be great for the originals, this would be great for Vampire Diaries, this would be great for Pretty Liars, this would be great for your indie film you're doing, this would be great for that. That helps. Okay, so zip MP3. Just MP3s. I mean, they're just small enough to email. You can just yeah. email MP3. Sure. Yeah, okay. but but use a box or something like that to send a link. Don't okay. just send straight to the email because you know add. So thousand, like a Dropbox or something. Yeah, Dropbox, yeah. Box, okay. Net, you send it or Hightail, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So. Yeah, I would also I would also go a step further and say think about how you're tagging your folders and your download links. You should you should tag your folders and your links with your name, and the name of the, the name of the music and perhaps the date. Don't tag it with my name and the name of the show, because I know my name and the name of the show. I'm looking to fi- I'm looking to find out who you are, and with the amount of music that we receive on a daily basis, I need to be able to catalog it, and I need to be able to search for it and go back to it. So, can you hear me? Yes, yes. So, so we're just um, cause it's kind of running out of time, unfortunately. Uh, so, unless there's any more questions, all right. One question. Come to the microphone, real quick. You got two seconds. Repeat your contact info, please. Sure, mine is NCIS Nola N O L A Music at Gmail. Thank you. And Chris, did you have one that you give out? Send Chris Music S E N D C H R I S M U S I C at Gmail dot com. PJ, do you have one you want to give or no? Um, yeah, it's Scott Aegis at the Jazz and Heritage <laughs> Foundation. <laughs> <laughs> I deserve that. All right, uh, on that, all right, I, I, real quick. Real quick, just you prefer all originals, like original mostly. If I have pure licensing, that's all mine. That's what you would prefer. No covers. I'm cool with covers too. I mean, it just matters on the place. I mean, you know, for on camera and stuff like that, that's definitely, you know, if it's a cover, a big cover, that publishing is going to jack up the price, which makes it prohibitive but um, no I mean there's certain things for placements I love covers if, if all writers and producers want a cover they're gonna put it in the script if you want to be on the show you're more likely to get your original song on than a cover covers originals PJ well, he's all, um, you're all no you're no, all covers I'm, you're all covers well on this one, I mean, on this I'm, one. I'm all covers on this particular show but it's only one show that I do I mean obviously I love originals covers are cool I mean covers are a great entry point for for a lot of bands and there's a lot of shows especially these contemporary ones that if it's a cool cover I mean in the world of in the world of trailers right now covers are everything cool covers of cool covers of of, of you know 80s or 70s songs that everybody knows that's the whole trip right now Fantastic. All right. Well, on that note, we are going to wrap this cover of day one of year eight of the Sync Up Conference originating here in the Treme neighborhood in New Orleans at the George and Joyce Ween Jazz and Heritage Center. PJ Bloom on Skype from Los Angeles. Chris Moler live and in person. Kyle Lammy live and in person here in New Orleans. PJ, man, thank you so much. Really appreciate you doing this, brother. All right. Y'all, thank you all so much. And we'll see you back here tomorrow morning. Thank you all for coming.